after me. I'm a man. I'm 40. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Nick DiMartino. That's Johnny Montalbano. This is another episode of Moving the Goalpost. You can follow us. You can follow the Empty Bench Network on Twitter, face uh, on Twitter, Facebook, Twitter, uh, bleh, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram at ETB Network. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Nick D, at Nick DiMartino. You can follow Johnny at Montalbano on Twitter at Montalbano and uh, Y. You can follow this show at MTGP ETB on on facebook twitter uh instagram and tiktok you can uh you can you can watch all empty the bench shows on youtube.com slash etv network you can listen to all empty the bench shows on etvpodcast.com you can listen to this show moving the goalposts wherever you get your podcasts and make sure to like and subscribe uh this show moving the goalposts is presented by playback watching sports is more fun with others but we spend too much time watching alone Playback is a virtual space where communities can stream live sports together with everyone perfectly synced up. Creators can hop on stage and deliver their own play-by-play analysis and commentary and invite viewers up for Q&A. Playback makes watching sports fully interactive and a social experience. From playing fantasy sports, repping your favorite players and teams, and watching with the commentators and communities you care about. Win or lose, sports are best enjoyed together. Join our community by going to playback.tv slash ETB Network to find out more, including our live stream schedule. Okay, so um, this is the dark ages, I would say, for New York football. I, I guess is how I would put it. Yeah, uh, I that's a good way of putting it. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of different you know verbiage and or mm-hmm. phrases or whatever you want to use to describe it because it is really it, really bad. It is yeah, it is brutal. It, I, I think it's brutal in different ways. Yes. Because, you know, you had one team that had expectations and another one who just, you know, pretty much laid a dud against arguably the worst team in the NFL. Yeah, well, uh, that, that's a pretty good debate today. Who feels worse, uh, Jet fans or Giant fans? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'm still I'm still feeling the effects of Sunday, and here we are a few days later. Yeah, well, I would argue Jet fans probably, and maybe I'm biased because I'm actually experiencing it. I think Jet fans probably feel worse. I, I would say so too because you guys at least had expectations going into this year. I mean, and, yeah. they, and you know, you want to talk about a team that pretty much is all in. I think the Jets are truly a team that's all in this year, unlike another team that says it but doesn't follow through with it. Well, the Jets went all in. That's yeah, the, thing. the Jets went all in to the point where tanking didn't even become an option. Like, which is what makes it so much worse. Uh, the, the Giants were didn't have high expectations, although their expectations were a little high. Or I would say they were expected to be a little better than two and eight. Oh, absolutely. At, yeah. at this point in the season. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, we'll get to them in a few minutes. But, I mean, five weeks ago we were talking about them possibly being almost a 500 team because everything was going their way. But I'll get to that when we get to Yeah. The- well, well, I think the difference is that Giant fans are used to winning a lot more than Jet fans are. That is the other thing uh, that makes it really awful for Giant fans. Yeah. The, and the plus other been, is – I mean, these these yeah. two teams have been the two of the worst teams in football over the last decade. I mean, that's not a that's not a reach. And that's with the Giants making the playoffs one year. Yeah. And now the Jets have the longest streak in the NFL of, making, of not making the postseason. So, I mean, there's a lot to it. It's not yeah. a lot of competition. I know we're making it because it's, we're both fans of the teams, but – it's, no, it's just yeah. to me. It's just an interesting comparison. Yeah, it's a comparison, not a, not a competition. That's it's fair. an interesting comparison, but what I, what I will tell you is that both of them are disgruntled. Is mm. how I would put it. Both are both both are disgruntled. Um, I, I mean, look. Okay, so getting to the Jets losing to the Cardinals, I'm not surprised that the Jets lost to the Cardinals. Um, 
I am surprised and a bit blown away by how bad it was, is how I would put it. We all know Kyler Murray is a tough quarterback, is a good quarterback. Um, I don't think the Cardinals are a bad team. I think they're a bit underrated. Um, it, it took them, it, it, I mean, it took kind of a while for people to come along with the Cardinals and everything uh, to actually believe in them. I always thought they were a good team. But here's the thing with the Jets. The problem with this loss is, first of all, it tells me how bad of a team it was, how bad of a team they are, considering they weren't even competitive. They didn't put up a single point in the second half. Um, the other is that when you lose easy games, like against New England and against Denver, games that you easily should be able to win, games like this become must-wins. That's the thing. If the Jets had actually won some of these games that they should have been able to win, this game is not a must win. So it wouldn't really be the end of the world if they had lost this, if they had lost to the Cardinals on the road, if they had won some of the pre, if they weren't, if they didn't already dig themselves in such a hole. Because 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 they dug themselves in such a hole, now this game is a must win. Not to mention the fact that like, their playoff hopes are realistically gone, especially after the Steelers beat the Commanders. I mean, there's no way they could possibly catch up to the Steelers or the Chargers. And I think there's almost no chance they could catch up to the Bengals. And given the hole that they've dug themselves in, they would basically have to win out. And I don't see that even happening. I don't even think they're going to go 500 for the rest of the season. Yeah, see, you know what the, the real tough thing I would take out of this, Nick D, is the fact that, you know, you come off of a Thursday night win against the uh, the Texans 10 days ago, and you actually feel a little bit of confidence after that. And, and you know, you, you have extra time to get ready for this game out in Arizona. You know, the Cardinals are not a great defensive team. Offensively, they, they're, they're definitely a threat. I actually think they're one of the better offenses in the league very, and a very underrated one at that. You know, we talk about Kyler Murray and – um, Maserati, Mar Marvin Harrison, but they have other guys too. They have one of the better tight ends in Trey McBride. They've got Mike Wilson. They've got James Conner. I mean, these they have some some playmakers there on an offense. But I think the real thing is just you know you have ten days to prepare. You have the extra time. You're coming off of a, a, a nice win against the, the Texans, and you just you, you go right back and it's like you took a couple of steps forward and then you go right back to square one again and. I think the other thing, too, is not only is it just the game, but it's just the the tone after the game. It's like, you know, when you hear Aaron Rodgers talk after the game, it's like he's – there's no emotion. There's no frustration that's coming out of any of these guys. Um, I think, though, what you're starting to realize, and I think you probably, you're probably smart enough to probably realize this, is that Robert Sala is, was not the problem. He may have been a problem – but he wasn't the problem, and it's a damn shame that he actually was really the guy, the scapegoat in all this because this team has gotten not only worse, they have gotten way worse since Salah got fired. Yeah. Uh, and you go you go out there and you trade for Devontae Adams. That has not really provided a spark yet. I mean, if, it, what, else are you, what else are you supposed to do? I mean – Well, I, I, I mean – I, I'll tell you, I don't think Robert Sala was a good coach. Uh, and I would have been fine with them maybe firing him at the end of the season or even firing him in the middle of the season. But the problem is Jeff Ulbrich is so much worse. That's the problem. Yes. and it, like, I'm so sorry. It, It's not even really arguable how much worse Jeff Ulbrich has been. The defense has been much worse under him than it was under Sala. That's not even really arguable. I mean, just and all, so many of the problems with the Jets right now are because of coaching. So many of them are because of coaching. Like the the problem is, I'm not I'm no solid defender at all. But I mean, don't fire him if you're not going to go out and actually get a head coach. Which realistically, in the middle of the season, is kind of a difficult thing to do. And Jeff Ulbrich was clearly not up for the job. He wasn't. He wasn't up for the job. Yeah, and. Uh, my, my, and, my thought my thought was that I think they sh if you were going to do that I think it should have been more than just just Sal that was that was fired because he yeah. wasn't the only problem I, there was there were myriad there were a ton of problems and there still are a ton of problems as we hit the middle of November yeah it, it was it was a very Woody Johnson uh, how do I say it, it was a very Woody Johnson uh, pull the trigger type of move 
uh, in a moment where it probably, it, it almost seems like he didn't even think it through. Yeah. I would say it almost seems like he didn't think it through. And, and like, look, I'm not saying he was a good head coach. He he was not a good head coach. Um, he was a good coordinator, but not a good head coach. But I mean, like, how could there's no way it could have helped. <laughs> there's no way it, it could have really helped. I, I think there it, it is really just a lot of the problems with the Jets right now is just bad coaching. That's a lot of it. I would say a lot of it is bad coaching. How many? I mean, just and on both sides of the ball. By the way, on both sides of the ball, um, the thing is, the first half was not that bad until the very end. And not until until the very end. I I mean, I'll say, first of all, the Jets' pass rush or their run and run defense is putrid. It's totally putrid. They give up big play after big play after big play. They give up a lot of. Uh, they can't stop. They couldn't stop a nosebleed. Uh, the nine, the, the Cardinals just controlled almost pretty much almost every possession. They had full control over every possession. Uh, saw scar. They can't tackle. Trey McBride looked like he could have been like Gronk. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you if you remember this play when Sauce Gardner uh, basically had Trey McBride wrapped up on third down. Oh. I mean, my God, yeah. well, a lot of defensive players who can't even tackle. Sauce Gardner weighs like 90 pounds. Uh, yeah, I'm out at a bar watching these late window games Sunday. And, you know, I'm not a Jet fan, but I'm watching that. I'm even getting frustrated watching yeah. it. I mean, I'm, I'm, Sauce Gardner has been an absolute disappointment this year, to say the least. And, you know, it's it's amazing how many steps back he's taken. I mean, I thought it was, he was such a great draft choice for them two years ago. And he is – He's regressed so much; it's 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 unbelievable. And just going back to what you were saying about the whole pass rush, this is a problem the Jets have had for about twenty years now. I mean, the, the, this was the one thing they were lacking when Rex Ryan was the head coach. You know, Rex was such a great defensive coach, and yet the one thing he didn't have that always makes a great defense is a great pass rush, and he didn't have that on those on those teams. They have not had a good legitimate. I mean, I think the last pass rusher I can remember on the team that was good was was Abraham. And that's pushing 20 years ago. It's almost 20 years ago. Yeah, if not over. And so, I, I mean, how you – if you talk about a team that's supposed to have a great defense not being able to get to the quarterback, I mean, that's that's really what's the, yeah. the start and the makings of a great defense is being able to get that. And they have not been able to do that for the longest time. And, and that also affects everything. Like, that affects every single thing that affects the secondary. I mean, look, even though Sauce Gardner, I think, has regressed a lot throughout – I mean, like, I, I don't – he hasn't done anything this year. Hmm. Useful, but I will say I think part of the reason Sauce Gardner has been getting burned so much is because the pass rush is not getting to the quarterback. And mm. I think that has a lot to do with it too, because secondary like corners are only defending wide receivers for a couple of seconds. At a certain point, they will all get burned if if, if the if the quarterback has too much time. So I think that's a part of it too. But the other is like. It, I mean, I don't know how you don't make – I mean, that could have changed. I mean, look, the Jets, based on the way they've been playing, even if Gardner had gotten that tackle, they probably would have lost anyway. And the wheels fell off in the second half. That really had nothing – or really at the end of the first half, I would say, that really couldn't be attributed to the defense. I mean, you're not winning any games in this league if you only score six points. No. But I will say, not only – there's a few things. Obviously, Sauce Gardner needs to be able to make that tackle. Like they, he had him completely wrapped up. I was like, and as soon as he like had him wrapped up like that, I thought, okay, this play is over. The other thing is, why is there no help? Why is Sauce Gardner by himself at that part of the field? Yeah, right. Like, like that. That to me just made no actual sense. And not only that, not only that, but like. The Cardinals extended that drive for like another four and a half minutes. It's yeah. like it was like after that point, everything went completely downhill for the rest of that drive. Yeah, and again, we've we've spoken about this a lot on all of our shows. I don't care how good of a defense you have; you're out there for long periods of time. You're going to get exposed, and against yeah. a very mobile team there in in the, in the Cardinals, it get, you get exposed to that. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's just. It's a disgrace, I would say. I think that this yep. team is a disgrace, and uh, mm-hmm. I, I would, I, I would say, I guess I had a glimmer of hope from the second half against the Texans. But the thing with the Jets is that, like, these 
the the good moments are the outliers. It's the good moments that are the outliers. Like the second half against the Texans where Aaron Rodgers had this amazing spark. It's like, yeah, that's that's one half out of at now 20 halves that they played. So they had they had a good game. They had a really good game against New England. They had uh they played a really good second half against Houston. So that's basically 15% of the time they really have it. 15% of the time. Nick, you know, <laughs> yeah. In in all the time that I've known you, how many times have I spoken to you? Have we spoken about this that the Jets can't put two good games together in a row? Is no. that Right, and that right. frustrates the heck out of you. And you would have thought if there was ever a time to do it, it would have been this with the extra time to prepare and the fact that the Cardinals are not a good defensive team. And you know, you're going out there with, you know, I know he's. Let's be honest, he's a shell of his former self, but you've got a, a better. You got Aaron Rodgers there under center still. Yeah, and it's just you know, once again a situation you can't put two halves together. And now they could come back out. I mean, they could play well again this Sunday going up against the Colts, but. You know, can they put together? Can they put together two weeks in a row like that? That's that's where you start getting. Fr- well, that's where the frustration continues. But you also have to look at the morale of the team. Like, oh, are they? Like, I, I I'm under the impression that like the the players and the coaches feel the same way we do. The fans, yeah. like, like they they kind of think it's all over. They know it, and the Colts are. I mean, look, all of these games are winnable, but they're also losable. I mean, like, the Cardinals are a tough team. Don't get me wrong. But you shouldn't be getting blown out by, like, four scores against them. Yeah. Uh, that, to me, tells me a lot about the Cardinals, but it also tells me a lot about the Jets. A- and also, it's like, it, it, the Jets were actually favored, believe it or not. They were one-and-a-half-point favorites. And it was a totally winnable game, is how I would put it. It was a totally winnable game. And, yeah, what you're saying is true. The Jets have no consistency. And it's been like this for a long time. Yeah. They can't, like, but not only is there no consistency in, in the sense that, like, they can't play two good two good games in a row. They can't even really play two good halves in a row. Like, like I don't even think they can play a good 60 minutes of football. When's, you know, when's the last time you actually felt comfortable at two, three games in a row with them? It's been a very long time. I mean, the only time I've become comfortable with it is because I've been comfortable and accepted the fact that they're bad. That's yeah. the only time I've been kind of comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I, I did get my hopes up at some point a bit. Uh, and and we were hanging on by a thread after that win against Houston. We were hanging on by a thread, even though I didn't think we'd be able to pull it off. Namely, because all of these games are just... It, like all of every single one of the games, the Jets will be favored, except against Buffalo and maybe Miami on the road. But they're going to lose a lot of these games because they lose a lot of these games that they're favored in. Well, what if I told you that they're favored this Sunday? Yeah, no, that's believable. Yeah, I, I mean, like a lot. I, I don't. I'm not one to like question Vegas lines or anything because, like, a lot of people are very like, qu- like look at Vegas lines and say, like, how can that be the line? It's like, look, they know what they're doing. It's their business to cr- to make these lines. Mm-hmm. They, they know a little better than we do. So there's probably a good reason for it. And the Colts are not a good team. So it's not saying much. I mean, it, it's going to be – I think you said it. it it's going to be the battle of, like, really old quarterbacks. Yeah, the ancient quarterbacks, Flacco against uh, against Rodgers, because they yeah. announced that Flacco is going to start on Sunday. Yeah. Well, the, the thing with Rodgers being old is that, like, I get that he's not what he once was, especially coming off an injury, but he hasn't been so bad to the point where there's no way the Jets could be a winning team. The Jets could be a winning team. A lot of it comes down to coaching, and there's a lot of really good players on the Jets too. A lot of really good players. I, I mean, some there's also a lot of players that are really good on paper that are just not nearly as good as they once were, which is a common Jets theme. Uh, I mean, Tyron Smith has just been awful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, but I mean, the offensive line has been awful, but like Rogers hasn't been so bad to the point where they couldn't possibly be a winning team. I mean, I'll tell you, I think the year, uh, the 2015 to 2016 Broncos season, uh, Peyton Manning was a lot worse than Aaron Rodgers is now. People forget but uh, Peyton Manning was so bad that he got benched for Brock Osweiler. And then they ended up winning the Super Bowl. Uh-huh. So. He was yeah. way more watched at that point in his career than Aaron Rodgers is now. And they were able to win a Super Bowl. 
so I think it's a lot more than just the fact that he's an aging 40-year-old quarterback. That's fair. I think it all goes back to the coaching in both of those instances here mm-hmm. and, and back then. And, and, but we also have some very good wide receivers. We have some good defensive players. It's not like the team lacks talent. It's like there's something yeah. rotten to the core of it. I mean, if, if you look at a team like the Panthers, for instance, which we'll get, we'll get to, the team is just not good. Like, the players are not that good. They don't really have good players anywhere on that team. I, I mean, it's, it, I mean, the quarterback is terrible. But with the Jets, they have good players. They have some really good receivers. It's just that they keep losing. <laughs> that's, that's the problem. Uh, like, New York football right now is just a total disgrace. Now, it, it's also... It's also the the case that, like, I'm worried about the future of the team, in a sense. Like, what does Rodgers do next year? None of us know because he's going to go on some other ayahuasca trip, and that's how he's going to determine his future because that's usually kind of what he does. And, uh, like, I'm worried he's going to retire and this whole thing will be over. And that will just be, like, the Brooklyn Nets big three level type of experiment failure but possibly even worse uh possibly even worse it's an interesting comparison it's good and that's a good point and i didn't think about that you know if he does retire where do they go for, where do they go for qb next year because you're not obviously going to draft one i don't know you need a stopgap guy really that's what it would really come down to yeah, and who would that stopgap guy be tyrod taylor uh he's not good anymore take take it from me last year he was awful last year and so uh I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what they're going to do. Uh, but that just makes me so worried about the future. And now I have not only that, but like we have to sit through the rest of this season. Yeah. I've had- we have to just sit through the rest of this season and just watch it completely unravel. Well, I, I think the thing you would have to do next year, and you know, we talk about coaching, I think they have to go out there and get a big, a big name head coach. And what I mean by that is. I mean, I'm not going to go to the extremes of like Rex Ryan, but I'm thinking John Gruden or you want to go down Mike Vrabel. I don't know why Mike Vrabel's name has not really been mentioned a lot, even in any of the shows that I watch and stuff. I think Mike Vrabel, I'll even give you another interesting name that came out on uh, Tuesday. You spoke about it with Adam Schefter. How about Brian Flores? You know, Brian yeah. Brian Flores spoke to Adam Schefter on Tuesday and said he wants to get back into co- – uh, he would love to be a head coach again next year. And you see what he's doing there with the Vikings on with their defense. I, I think Brian Flores would be a very interesting fit for this team. Well, you're forgetting one really good one. What's that? Bill Belichick. Yeah, I, I think I, I'll be honest. Here. I know <laughs> I Bill's name. No, because they're even talking about it for the Giants. I'll be honest with you. I like Bill. I think that ship has sailed, though. I'll be honest with you. I think I, it, he would have he would have been coaching this year. I, I think the the league told you this year that uh, this year that I think that that era is over with. You. I uh, you, you, you say that because nobody hired him. Is that why? Yeah, I think so. Yes, unless uh, they were waiting in the wings. I, I, but also, if you're Bill, I mean, I know you love to coach, but you got it made right now. Why would you go back into coaching if you're doing all this TV stuff and everything else? I mean, I think well, you've got it made. That's why I think the Mike Vrabels of the world would be would be more realistic and more likely. Well, the thing is, I don't like people often say Bill Belichick would never coach the Jets because he has this, uh, you know, he hates the Jets and things I like don't that. Believe that. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, I, I don't know if he hates the Jets as much as people say he does. No, I think I think that I think that's a little that's a little silly. I mean, they they paid him a lot of money and they right. gave him the right if they gave him the right team. I think I think Bill would come coach. Well, if they paid him enough money, I think he'd end up. Co- I think he maybe would coach the Jets. Um, I would. I would be open to it. I mean, he's arguably the best head coach ever. Um, he's he's up there for sure. Yeah. And maybe, like, I don't know if it's so much an era thing with Bill Belichick or it's just that he lost Tom Brady. <laughs> like, he, does, it, he it went from Tom Brady to both. Mac Jones. Like, that could be it, too. Yeah, so, and I think it could be a combination of both, though. Yeah, it could be. I guess it could be a combination of both. Um I mean, I, you know, I guess the counter that would be like Andy Reid, though, still going strong then with the Chiefs. I mean, I guess that would be my counter. That would be everybody's counter if you're saying that. But well, well, the, well, the thing is, though, they're very different types of head coaches. Yes, Reid and, and and Belichick, and also Belich- uh, Reid has Reid has Patrick Mahomes 
when his best quarterback before that was Donovan McNabb. Like, like McNabb doesn't compare to Mahomes. And also, it's just like, I do find it funny how much the narrative around the head coaches has changed. Like, like imagine if less than a decade ago, if you had compared Andy Reid to Bill Belichick, you were just some kook. You were just a, you really were just some kook. Like, oh, no, it is a given that Bill Belichick is so much better than Andy Reid. And then once they flip positions and – and Bill Belichick gets mediocre quarterbacks, and and Andy Reid has one of the best quarterbacks ever. Well, now that narrative completely changes, and Andy Reid kind of proved everybody wrong. So now they're actually very comparable as head coaches, it looks like. Um, that's just a weird thing about coaching, about how, like, sports fans' perceptions about these uh, about these types of things. Uh, enough of the Jets. Enough of the Jets. <laughs> We're talking enough about this. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll get to them again next week or the week after. Or we will. There'll be something else. Something else, because this team never fails to amaze me, is no. how I would put it. Oh, by the way, by the way, even uh, – I do want to talk about this a little bit. This is not about the Jets per se, but it is about MetLife Stadium and how bad the customer service is at MetLife Stadium. You see this cup right here that I have? Yeah. You know the backstory of this cup? I uh, know. I I I know you. I don't know. Why I ask because you. I know you don't know. <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. <laughs> I've never I've never been to MetLife Stadium as much as on all the times I wanted You've to get. You've never that. been to MetLife Stadium. I have not. I've never been to a football game, pro or college. You've I, never been to a football game your whole life. You want a funny story? My first football game that I was supposed to go to was supposed to be this past this past Sunday. It was supposed to be. Up? It was supposed to be because the game got moved to Germany. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> so you didn't fly to Germany. You know, I could have because I had two friends that offered me a, a, a trip, uh, offered me a way to get there. Um, the money wasn't the issue. It was the time off from work. I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it. Yeah. I would have yeah. loved, I would have loved to. It's actually not a bad flight. It would have been from Myrtle Beach to Charlotte and then Charlotte to Munich, which is only about seven hours going to Charlotte. You can fly from Myrtle to- Beach to Charlotte? What's that? You can fly from Myrtle Beach to Charlotte? Yeah, it's well, it's it's one of those like the it's almost like a shuttle flight or like a, a like a that would be using it as like a connector almost. Oh, okay. People okay. connect because you can't fly from Myrtle Beach to many places, so people would either go fly to um, Charlotte or to Atlanta and then connect from there to go other places. Like if I was to go to Vegas, like I know you're going to Vegas next week, yeah, uh, I would have to go probably through Charlotte and then fly Charlotte to Vegas. Right. Right. Um... Okay, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Uh, but yes, but, but continue. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I – and by the way, airline food is – I haven't flown in almost five years. It's been a real – pre-COVID was the last time I flew. Yeah. Um, so this cup right here. So here's what happened. I was at the Jet. This was – and I could have talked about this earlier, but I just never got to it. <laughs> I was at the Jets-Bills game, and I went to go get a cup of coffee. And they sell – Duncan coffee at jet games okay. by the way the coffee was complete dog shit uh <laughs> worth noting uh Duncan coffee is disgusting and I feel comfortable saying that because they're not sponsoring us or anything so I don't yes, feel I feel totally fine saying Duncan coffee is terrible but I'll say I what happened was I I went to get a cup of coffee at one of the stands and they ran out of Duncan cups so they said to me we're we're out of Duncan cups we're going to have to give you this Jets cup. But, is it, which, all right, fine. But we're going to charge you extra for that cup. They ran out of the Dunkin' Cups. So they had to they had to put the coffee in this cup, and they didn't just give it to me for the same price when That's, they ran out oh, of the cups. That is that is awful. Oh my like the god! Jets, I mean, but not surprising though. Really, not you look- surprising. But my god, that is like the worst customer service. Like you run out of the cups, and now I have to pay for that. You're right. Yeah, you have to pay for something that's their that's their fault. Yeah. It how, does that make, like, how does that make sense? It does. I mean, that would never look, happen. You're gonna run like, out of stuff. I get that, but yeah, that would never happen at like a restaurant or anything. Like, it, like. It would almost be like if you were on a plane and they moved you to first class because they had to move you to first class, and then they charged you for moving you to first class. <laughs> that, yeah. That's, that, that's what it would be like. That, that is a pretty good comparison. But wow. So, that's, it, 
MetLife, I, I had another story, actually, uh, a terrible uh, customer service story at MetLife Stadium. I was at the a Jet game maybe a year ago or two years ago, I think. Actually, yeah, more, more like two years ago. It was the Jets-Jaguars game. Ooh. And it was a game that they that they brought in Strevler. Oh, jeez. At the end of the game. That's how bad it oh, was. Was that the Thursday night game a couple of years ago? Thursday night game. I remember that, yeah. And the thing is, you know it's bad when I'm talking about the customer service when the game was bad enough. <laughs> Man, I mean, that's a double whammy right there. So, basically, I was given uh, – I was I had – a gift card basically of, you know, I had a certain amount of money that I had to spend. And if I didn't spend it, it all went to waste. So I wanted to spend the money that I had on this gift card. And I thought, so I went to the gift shop, you know, at at MetLife stadium to get like, to buy a hat, a Jets hat. And I thought that I had that. It was like, I had separate money for the food and separate money for like all the gift shop stuff. So, but what happened was I bought the hat and I didn't, I didn't, and I didn't have enough money on the card because I thought it was a separate thing, but, but it wasn't. So I said, okay, then I don't want the hat. I'd rather spend that money on the food. So I, I, I said, I want the purchase to be canceled. Okay. So afterwards I go to buy the food to go buy more food and it, it gets declined. Apparently I had no more money on my account. So it turns out they didn't cancel that my purchase of the hat even so i still had the money taken out for me i didn't have the hat so it, so what happened was i go back i go back there and say hey look i wanted this purchase canceled can i get my money back and they said and they said to me we can't give you your money back because the representative leaves at halftime and that's the only <laughs> person who can actually do it. it's like how many games do you work you leave at halftime like that's the whole. You work at MetLife Stadium, and you're you you can't even like work for an entire game. The game is like what three hours. You can't stay the whole game. What are you even there for? So, I so they tell me. So game. here's the best, and it gets better because the amount of money taken out of my account was not enough to actually cover the cost of the hat. I had two choices: either I just don't let the money go to waste and don't buy the hat or pay the extra money just to get the hat. So that, I ended up paying extra money just to get the hat that I didn't even want. On top of the money that you're spending to get to the get to, for the ticket, trying to yeah. get to the game, <laughs> everything. Yeah. Well, we all know what happened when they had the Super Bowl back 10 years ago and how messed up that was towards the end. And they hear all these customer service stories. MetLife Stadium will never get another Super Bowl in our lifetime. Yeah, these are these are just some of the, two cases in a, only a couple of years that are just oh my god, just awful. If anybody um, from if anybody there is listening to this uh, to this episode, you know, talk to Nick D about this because that this is a disgrace. This is terrible. You think the product on the field is a disgrace. Oh my <laughs> yeah, god. Like the product on the field wasn't bad enough. No, <laughs> yeah, if it was. It's better. I mean, geez. I mean, uh, so, speaking of which, though, there's more. Yeah, Jets, Panthers. Jets lose to Panther, lose to the Panthers in Germany. Oh, uh, in Germany. I don't know if you saw the ref doing the uh, speaking German. Oh, I, that was the best part of the game, Sean. I loved. It. Yeah, it was. I, I didn't. I don't know if that ref actually speaks German or not, or if they just told him what to say. Well, apparently, Ed Hockley, uh, who you know, Sean Hockley obviously is related to, when they had an international game, he did he. He had a call in that language too. So in it, German, plus, I don't think it was in Germany because they're not. They weren't in Germany. I'm trying to remember where it was. Oh, um, I could look it up really quick, but um, yeah, that that was the be- that was that was the fun part of yeah. Sunday morning. The, yeah, the game itself was. Oh my god! I mean, I don't even know where to even start. Yeah. Well, so I mean, just I mean, the Giants shot themselves in the foot in this game, is how I would put it. Yes. The Giants, I, I would say, uh, I mean, th- you can't lose this game. <laughs> That's the problem. You can't lose this game. The Panthers are, like, supposed to be, like, the worst team in the league. Not to mention the fact they're coming off a big win, so they probably have a bit of a high. They literally – they they just got Dennis Allen fired. Dennis Allen probably should have been fired at the end of last year, but that's a different story. And they're probably coming in a high with a high, and it just seems like it would be a classic letdown for the Panthers. 
And the Panthers, they don't have good players anywhere. Their quarterback stinks, their pass rush stinks, their offensive line stinks. Everything about the Panthers stinks. They well, get killed by huge margins because their defense is terrible. There's one exception. The 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 running back uh, Chuba Hubbard is is really good. I mean, they just gave him an exception. Yeah. He ran all, and he ran all over the Giants on Sunday morning. Yeah, there in Germany. Yeah, Nick D. It just annoys me because you and I spoke about this on the football forecast last week about how atrocious the Panther defense is. And you know, there were times that the Panther defense actually looked really good. And maybe that's because the Giants allowed them to be good. But I mean, it's just it's it's gross because once again, you know. The, Gi- the two best players in the Giants were, you know, the running back Tyrone Tracy and Brian Burns. You know, that that's it. Everybody else on this team, it's just not been there. And, again, the quarterback, Daniel Jones, and you heard it from uh, Kurt Warner on the broadcast on Sunday. Just he continues to do these same things over and over and over again that just, you know, boggle the mind. I mean, we're in year six with him, and we're still talking about things that rookie quarterbacks, you would understand that they're making. But – he's making it in year six. Yeah. And, and by the way, you look at a player like Jaden Daniels in, in your division, uh, mm-hmm. who's not making these mistakes and he's a rookie and he's not making any of these mistakes that Daniel Jones is still making. Right. right. I, I don't think Daniel Jones has it. I, I think that giant fans got their hopes too much about Daniel Jones because he won a playoff game against the Vikings two years ago. And, and they or thought, he had a, yeah, it was a better yeah. team. You know what, what? I mean, to be fair in that regard, he had an offensive line that yeah. year. He doesn't have that. I mean, he had that for the for about a four or five week stretch, and now he doesn't have that. But he's also making bad throws though, too. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, there's a lot of mistakes he's making that have nothing to do with the offensive line. Yes, that there are mistakes that he's making be, with the offensive line and not because of the offensive line. Right. And if you're still questioning this, then he cannot be the answer anymore. It's like I yeah. almost compare this to like a Hall of Fame player. If you're questioning that somebody is a Hall of Fame player, then he's not. If you're still questioning if he can be the answer, right. He's not. I mean, and, right. If you're questioning if a guy is a Hall of Famer like 20 years after he retired, yeah. That, well, yeah, but I mean, also if you're you're debating his career, if you're not certain that he's a Hall of Famer, he's not a Hall of Famer. I mean, right, let's be right. honest. It's the same thing with the quarterback situation for an NFL team six years in. I, right. I mean, it almost was like that with Justin Fields in Chicago. You could you could say too. I mean, they were there. There was a lot of talk about that. If he was the answer, and you're still questioning it five six years in. He can't be. And and let's be honest now. And I, and I keep saying this, there is no better time if you're going to make the change than, than now. You're on your bye week. You, you, it gives you two weeks to prepare for the next opponent, which is the Bucs, which is not going to be great, even though the Bucs are missing players, although they might be getting healthier by then. I mean, it really is the perfect time to make the switch. And I agree, though, with Brian Dable by not making – I mean, you don't come out and make this and overreact on, like, Monday or Tuesday. Give it a couple of days. Really sit down and think. You know, Joe Shane did have his press conference on Tuesday. I, I think, I think they're going to make the switch. It might take till you might not hear it till the end of this week, but I think they're going to make the switch. And let's be honest, if you're going to make the switch, it you only makes. The, what's that? You think they will make the switch? I do, and I think I, honestly, I think they would make the switch to Devito because that's what makes the that's what makes the most sense for this team right now. They're Nick. They're two and eight. They are the second overall pick right now in the draft for next year. And in some ways, you could say it's even worse because if you look at all those, if you look at this team, they still have players on this team. The running backs been a, have been a success. The you know they still lead the league in sacks. They they've got some guys on this team. So in some ways, they this literally could be this is literally like the lowest point in this organization. I don't think I, I agree with you that it makes the most sense for them to do it. I just don't think they're going to. Well, what's the point? What's the point in playing him, though? There isn't. There isn't. But I, that doesn't mean that they're going to. That doesn't mean that Dable's going to make that switch. I, I don't. And I don't. Us. And let's. But I, I. And I got to say this too. I don't think he should be fearful for his job because honestly, I don't think him would. And this might be a hot take. And Giant fans, you can come at me at Montepon and Y on Twitter about this. I don't think Brian Dable or Joe Shane should be fired after this year because honestly, I don't think this is on them. Because if you look at Joe Shane's drafting, for the most part, his draft choices have been have been successful. Brian Dable is – Brian Dable – that's is another thing, too. He gave Daniel Jones every opportunity on Sunday to go out there and win that game. He could have switched – he could have made the switch during the game on Sunday. And I truly believe, you know, he went up to him and was ripping him a new one. 
And I think he truly was like, Danny, I'm giving you every last chance. Go out there and win this game for us. And he couldn't do it. And then, of course, you know, Tyrone Tracy, who was has been one of the better giant players this year and who had a great game, fumbles on the first yeah. or second snap in overtime, puts the Panthers in great field position to kick that game-winning field goal. Yeah. Well, I don't think that uh, – there are certain things that – like the way the Giants lost this game, it's a little bit hard to blame on coaching. Like it's not Brian Dable's fault – that Daniel Jones threw two, two interceptions in the red zone, and Graham Gano missed an easy, missed a forty-two yard field oh, goal. I mean, I mean yeah. they just—I mean, that's you can't be making mistakes like that in the red zone. You can't be doing that. And one of them is just like Daniel Jones. He like threw a, it was tipped, and he like threw it off the defender's helmet. It looked like, yeah, like the guy was right in front of him, and and it, like you can't be making these mistakes in the red zone. And if Graham Gano just, even if they did make both, even if, even if like the, he did throw those two interceptions, Graham Gano also misses the easy 42 yard field goal. The Giants probably win that game. So, yeah. I, I mean, look, I'm not only blaming the kicker, but it's just like, this looked like the way the Jets would lose. Special teams season. has been a problem this year for the Giants. I mean, they've gone through three yeah. kickers. You know, it's, 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 it, that's been a problem. There's a bunch of there's a d- bunch of problems on this team. Coaching to me is not a pro- is not one of them, or it's not at the top of the list. If there's one thing you wanted to criticize Brian Dable about, it would have been that game against Washington the first time when he didn't have a backup kicker. That that obviously was a major mistake. I can't. I, I think they were. Here's the thing, though. I think that I don't think that's is it's exactly the reason they're losing. But there are some games that you can point to where the coaching was a problem. For instance, I don't think the coaching was exactly the reason they lost this game. However, I do think coaching was a pretty big problem when they played the Commanders. That That's fair, yeah. And look, there's no way that coaching is not going to get blamed in some of this. But, I mean, if you're telling me – but I, I don't think – I mean, you. That's this has been one of the problems with this team. There's been no stability in the last – ever since Tom Coughlin left. Yeah. If you look at some of these teams, like, you know, dare I bring some of these teams up, like the, the Las Vegas Raiders who seem to change a coach every single year. Look at the, the Chicago Bears who just fired their second offensive coordinator in 10 months. I mean, it's, you know. It, it is weird to me how some teams operate that way w- that are just so trigger happy to get rid of everybody. Yeah. Because it never works. It doesn't. And that's why I think if you're the Giants, I would not be doing that. Yeah. I mean, let's it, be fair. Joe Shane's drafting for the most part has been a success for this team. I mean, the guys that he's that he's drafted have made have made some have made an impact. You know, it I think he's kind of almost getting justified for the for letting uh, uh Saquon Barkley leave and then getting Tyrone Tracy in the fifth round. Yeah, I mean let's be honest he, too, Saquon yeah, it, Barkley would not be doing what he's doing in Philadelphia with this no. team. He's in a better system. I said the same thing. Also, if you look at Sterling, people are going to get on him about Sterling Shepard. I think that's garbage. Sterling Shepard, and I love the guy. Trust me, he's one of my favorites. He's in a great system down there in Tampa Bay. He would not be doing this if he was on this or in this team. No, no way. And that's and, what and, and, everyone wants to get on about it. Sterling Shepard and Saquon Barkley, the amount of money they'd be spending for what? That maybe they have one extra win. one win, probably. I would say maybe, maybe one extra. They'd be three and seven. And l- let me point this out, by the way. The Giants, similar to the Jets, Giant fans also have to be very concerned about the future, given that they're totally behind the eight ball worse than they ever were in this division. Now, it's always tough enough to be in the same division as the Eagles and the Cowboys, but now you also have the Commanders with a good young quarterback. So, it, and the Giants have, so, you, so now you have the Commanders, the Eagles, and the Cowboys. Now, I know the Cowboys aren't good this year, but it's not going to last. It's not going to stay that way. The Cowboys will still probably always be better than the Giants for the most part, as long as they You're not be saying have, much right now. This as long as they have yeah. Dak. So now yeah. the Giants could end up being in the toughest position in the NFL and also be one of the worst teams in the NFL. I, I don't think that's a reach. I yeah, don't like a... that is. I'm not saying that's definitely going to happen, but it looks like it probably will, based on how all of their division rivals have been playing and the trajectory of those franchises. The only thing, and here's the thing with the Giants, that's always been a problem. They've always been bad, but not too bad. Like like they were bad enough to like they were bad bad enough to have like a top ten pick, but they were never quite bad enough to get a number one or a number two pick and get this game changing quarterback. Yeah. That, that's the only thing that might work well enough for the Giants is that maybe they can get so bad 
to the point where they just tank and they really get some game changer at quarterback. Yeah, the problem though, Nick D, with that is I think this team, and understand how I'm going to say this, I think this team is too talented to tank. I think they're going to get them. So too. That's what I think. The pro- and I and everybody's been saying, well, why don't you just tank the rest of the way? So there's no way. I said first of all, and, and you think Brian, and you think Brian Dable or, or Joe Sheen want to tank this season away? No. First of all, the problem, the thing, the thing with tanking is the fans want it. The owners might even want it. But the coaches and the players are not going to tank. Exactly. Oh, see, there's Brian Dable right yeah. now. <laughs> and uh, John Merritt right now. And um, this is what happens on in this. In this I, room. You, you can get up and, you know, cancel the call or whatever. You know? <laughs> uh, this is why I don't have a landline. Yeah, I have to learn. There's, I don't know why I have a landline. By the way, they put this one in the uh, funnies for the rest of the year. Yeah. Um. But – yeah, I, I that's the thing. So I'm looking at like the like one through ten wait, right wait, now. Wait, wait. No, it, they didn't leave a message. In okay, okay. It, it would have been really funny if they had left a message. Yeah, that, that would have been great. But that's <laughs> just another one of these great telemarketers and robocalls that we have in South Carolina. But if you look at the the draft order one through ten right now, if you know the draft was going to happen, I mean, you have the Jaguars, the Giants, the Browns, the the Raiders. The um, well, the, Dol- the Dolphins won, so maybe this order is not accurate. But nevertheless, you you get oh wait that that actually isn't the right order. But anyways, you get where I'm saying. You get where I'm going to come out with this. The Giants, like I'm telling you, with you know their defensive line, which you know can get sacks and you know can can turn the ball over and give them the short field positions with a running back in Tyrone Tracy, who's been a successful player this year, with Malik Neighbors, who's put up some great numbers as a rookie for a wide receiver, they're going to win another couple of games this year. And what if, like, let's say week 18, they play the Eagles. What if the Eagles already have this, the number one seed already locked up by then? They're not going to want to play any of their players. And it would also and would also be very Eagles-like to give the I don't Giants think it's a win happen. and sabotage them. Yeah, that's true. I don't think, first of all, I think that the Eagles, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing. I don't think they will. They probably won't. The NFC is too competitive. And I, there's no, a I good say, chance. There's a good chance for the Eagles. I'm not saying this is guaranteed that the division will be on the line between them and the commanders. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that depends on what happens this weekend between or sorry, Thursday night. Yeah. That's between be the Eagles game. and the Commanders. Yeah. But no, it it's look, it's bad. I mean, I'm telling you right now, I'm I watched that game Sunday morning. I left there and I didn't really have much of a voice to begin with because of allergies. I just sat there at the bar and I just was like, I put my hands up. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I think the first thing they got to do is make the change at QB coming out of the bye week. There's no better time to do it. Yeah. You know, you give your, you give him two weeks to prepare. You don't have to worry about Daniel Jones's injury um, clause in the contract. I mean, that's really, if, if, if they don't make the switch now going into week, 12 against the Bucks. I don't see the Giants then may, ever making the switch. Because why would you do it the rest of the way? What's what's the point? Right. There's right. There's, there's no reason. I, and I like Brian Dable and I like Joe Shane. I still trust both of them. But I would be very, very worried about them if they tell me that Daniel Jones is going to be my starter next, next in week 12. Does – I think Brian Dable almost reminds me a little bit of Ben McAdoo in a sense – in terms of the trajectory of his career uh, as a giant, as I a mean, giant, it's looking coach. like that because McAdoo had a good first year, exactly, and a terrible second year, terrible second year, and then had a very low moment, obviously with Eli. Man, I didn't really think of it like that. And it's, it's a similar thing with Dable. He had a good playoff win, and what's happened since then? It's it hasn't yeah, been good. It's it's been awful. I mean, somehow this team won six games last year. And that's my thing. I think they're probably going to get to like four or five, and they're probably going to drop down in the draft order. Yeah. So um, thank God there's a lot of other football, though, growth pro in college that I could watch and, you know, enjoy. So Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there, there are – I don't know. So the command the Steelers, they beat the Commanders. And, you know, we were just talking about the Commanders and everything and the Steelers and how the Steelers are just – way ahead of the Jets and everything. Mm. Did you see who caught that touchdown? Mike Williams. Mike Williams. Of course. Of course, Mike Williams. <laughs> you know, 
the thing I say about this game because there's a few things to take away from it. First off, the unbelievable uh, catch um, by for the Steelers to start the game, but here and I know we're going to talk about that spot at the very end where the Commanders came up short on that call. Look, I always say this to people: never, never, never underestimate Mike Tomlin. Yeah, he always finds a way. And right now, to me, Mike Tomlin is right up there for Coach of the Year this year. Between, yeah. if you think, I mean, he he's might. at least a top three candidate for sure. Um, because if you look at this team, I mean, he's doing this with Justin Fields and Russell Wilson. Um, this was a very, very good test for them. Uh, the, maybe the only negative about this was that um, Highsmith, Alex Highsmith, got hurt, and he's already been ruled out of their game on Sunday against the Ravens. But Mike Tomlin always seems to find a way when everybody tries to doubt him. And I know there are Steeler fans that don't like him because I mean he consistently get wins, but he doesn't win the the like deep, he doesn't in the, win the playoffs. deep in the playoffs. But I mean he's the model of consistency, Nick. I mean that's really what it is, and he he finds a way to do it. And yeah, well, he's just, finding a way to do it this year. I wouldn't say he's consistent every year. Many years he is not. I would say. Yeah. No, I mean, but this but, year it's just working really well. But and if you think about it, also in a division where you can make the case that the other three teams were entering the year, they were projected to do pretty well. I mean, obviously the way <laughs> you always look good back the on it, it's like the Browns were supposed to be good. Yeah. Well, their biggest problem, if they had a competent quarterback, I I think they they would at least have five or six wins this year. Yeah. Uh, and not the, more. Yeah. Yeah. And, and <laughs> so it looks like. The Steelers, I don't think they'll win the division, but they'll probably be the first wild card team. Uh, yes, I, I I agree with you on that. Yeah, um, I don't. I mean, I don't see them getting up above the Ravens. Um, I think the Ravens are, you know, they've got an MVP candidate. They got yeah. the Offensive Player of the Year. I mean, the Ravens. I do have concerns with Baltimore. Their defense. The Ravens defense. They give them a lot of points. They give up a lot of points. I, but I, I did. Nick, I, I don't know if I told you this. I don't know why they didn't go out there and get a, a, a defensive player from deadline time. And the big move they made was Deontay Johnson, which made no sense to me. It, that being said, that being said, I still think this Ravens team is much better than last year's Ravens team. Yeah, because they have Derrick Henry. I mean, if you remember, that was it, the big thing that yeah. killed them against the Chiefs is they only ran six times last yeah. year. Yeah, I think team. Lamar Jackson led the team in rushing yards. And I'm always the mm -hmm. first to say, if your quarterback leads your team in rushing, that means you don't have a competent running back. By the way, George Pickens is the guy that I was talking about that made an unbelievable catch in the end zone. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so. so I – It's a tricky spot for the true. commanders now because it's a heartbreaking loss, you know, especially with that – that uh, spot that was so close that they didn't, that they didn't get on that fourth down at the, the very end there. And yeah. they now have to go out short week, play a division rival in Philadelphia who's red hot right now. That's a, it's a very first good first test for Jaden Daniels and Dan Quinn there and yeah. the commanders. Um, so, and by the way, right now, I think the Lions might be the best or, or the best team in the NFL overall. Uh, like I think that I think my prediction right now is a Lions Chiefs Super Bowl. From the way that the Lions have been playing now, we don't have to talk that much about the game. But what right. I will say is Jared Goff threw five interceptions and they still won the game. How many teams can throw five interceptions and still win? No. <laughs> very, very few. And I'll say this: you know what makes a great team? They find ways, they find ways to win all different kinds of games. And that one was the perfect example on Sun on Sunday yeah. night. I mean, the only negative that may have came out of that is that Jared Goff might have cost himself the MVP. In that uh, yeah. Sunday night, but I don't I mean, think he was going to win MVP anyway. No, but I mean, he would have been definitely in consideration. I mean, he was completing about eighty-four percent of his passes there for a few weeks stretch, and you couldn't expect that to continue. But I mean, when you're down twenty-three to seven, and you make that kind of ferocious comeback with five interceptions, I mean, great, great teams find a way to win all those kind of games. Now they get a very favorable matchup on Sunday. Um, yeah, Lions and Chiefs seems to be the the easy pick. Uh, if there's anything that we've learned though through ten weeks, I can't figure this league out. Yeah. I think somebody's going to get hot at the right time. That's what it seems to be the case. I still think the Chiefs, I mean, even though they're 9 and 0, I still concern me in some ways and I think they're going to eventually lose a game. I think the Bills maybe can beat them. This, maybe this week. <laughs> but yeah, I um, think the Bills could probably beat them. I mean, they have the smallest plus uh point differential for a 9 and 0 team I think in NFL history. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but that makes sense. I thought I saw NFL, 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 NFL Live post a stat. I think it was they're plus 58, which means they're winning they every game they won by is by less than a touchdown on average. Yeah. Well, 
how many nine and O teams have there been? Not that many. I'm trying to, well, I obviously the Patriots when they went on the field in the regular season, right. I think it was the last, I'm trying to think the last, I, was that the last one? I thought there might've been one more team race in between that. That was nine and O at one point. Yeah, I'm sure there were a few, but but it, it, I don't think that stat is saying that much when you consider the fact that there are only there have only been a handful of nine and O teams. Yeah, um, it really, I mean, it really is remarkable what they're doing. I mean, the the, the Chiefs. I mean, the fact that they got very lucky with that blocked field goal at the very end. Because I'll tell you what, the Broncos say what you want. The Broncos played them very very well almost should have yeah. even won that game on uh, on sunday but um so yes uh, okay so they're the 23rd team in the super bowl era to start a season with at least nine straight wins oh wow 23rd and, and there's the, they're the smallest point differential that's actually more than i thought there would have been yes um Interesting. Latin, the, I, the last team that started like this was the twenty. Well, the twenty twenty two Eagles were eight and zero. The twenty twenty Steelers were eleven and zero, and then finished twelve and four. Oh, okay. Not many of those teams, though. By the way, that started nine and zero or something won the Super Bowl. Yeah, so, yeah, it's true. But we'll see. Maybe maybe they should have lost a couple of games. I don't know what they were thinking. Well, I, I think it's going <laughs> to happen. I, I thought I, I I had them going sixteen and two. 16 and 2? Yes. So, I'm sorry. 15 and 2. 15 and 2. Okay. I, I got confused for a second. Uh, they, they added an 18th game. Oh, and <laughs> they're going to eventually. Uh, so I do want to get into the college football. Yes. Uh, some of the college football stuff, the playoff picture. Ole Miss beats Georgia. I am absolutely floored by this. Ole Miss was a team that couldn't win the big game. They were a team that couldn't win the big game uh, and, and often blew a lot of games. Georgia was a team that and they've been like this for arguably a few years that were that played down to their competition and was bad and played bad games but was able to win against mediocre teams like Florida or Kentucky uh but for the big games they always showed up and i was wrong but it also made a lot like i was wrong for all the right reasons is how i would put it mm-hmm. like i like i had every reason to believe georgia would win this game but it turns out that georgia's problems were even bigger than I thought they were it turns out that like their offense really is not good right now and it goes and it's beyond just Carson Beck I mean they only it seems like they only really first of all they played one good half against Texas and I was listening to Joel Klatt so I don't want to say I'm the first person to bring this up but he brought this up which Mm -hmm. I thought was a really good point he said the outliers for Georgia were all of the good games that they've played that the outliers were when they've played well and not when they've played bad. Yeah. Because it, it seems like them playing bad is actually the norm now It's for this season. Well, it's been a lot of their season. That's that's the, the thing. I mean, I would take it from the third week on when they played, when they were at Kentucky, they struggled in that game. They got very fortunate because Kentucky decided to, you know, kick a, a punt away, a fourth down at midfield very late in that yeah. game fourth and short at midfield where they go for it and can convert, they probably could have won. You know, obviously we know what happened with Alabama. You know, they, they got past Auburn, but even that was a little bit of a struggle. They struggled with Mississippi State. Uh, Texas, obviously, that was a defensive reason why they won. They scored 30 points. You know, Florida they, Florida challenged them, and then obviously they laid a total dud against Old Miss. And obviously now they have a huge matchup Saturday against Tennessee. It, it's, it's funny because – I think what's going to end up happening with how the SEC is shaping up this year is they might there 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 might be a three loss SEC team that makes the the, uh, the twelve team playoff. No, you don't. No, no three loss team has a shot at making the playoffs. I, you know, it's it, what they might look at though is no no you, no there's there's zero chance that could happen. If. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they might also look though at who you lose to as well. Like right well, now, what three, what three loss team in any conference could make the playoffs this year? It would. Well, not in the not obviously in the Big Ten. They wouldn't make that because, but it, it's going to be fascinating to see because you have a but you have a couple of one or two loss schools already in the SEC. 
and they might just try and get him on name recognition. I don't think it's going to happen, but I'm saying there's a possibility in my Well, happen. the thing is, is that there will likely be five, ten, and there will be not only can a three loss SEC team not make it, there will be a 10 and two team that doesn't make it, most likely. I mean, J- Tennessee will be probably maybe, I'm guessing, 10 point underdogs when they go play at Georgia. And I think Georgia probably wins that game. And it's not because I'm really high on Georgia, but also more low on Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee's defense is really good, and Georgia will struggle against them. But their offense has not clicked very much throughout the season. Only in like the fourth quarter against Alabama did their offense finally click. So what probably is going to happen is you're going to have a 10-2. and You're going to have a one-loss Texas team if they win the SEC. You're going to have a two-loss Ole Miss, two-loss Georgia, two-loss Alabama, and two-loss Tennessee. All 10-2 and two teams and an 11-1 and one Texas team. I mean, I will say, this SEC, this year in the SEC, it's the hardest to figure out. Because mm-hmm. usually you can make a good case for who the best team is. But this year, there's no good answer. You know what I mean? There's no right answer. It's like, you can say Texas, but you could also say, well, Georgia really uh, manhandled them in their own stadium. You can't say Georgia... Exactly, because, well, they just lost, they got killed by Ole Miss and they lost to Alabama. You can't really say, you can't really say Tennessee. Uh, and you know, and you probably wouldn't say Alabama either. Like, there's no exact right answer for who the best team is. You know what I mean? Like, it's impossible well, to sort of figure out. What the committee's going to have to decide here in these coming weeks is, and we'll get some more, um, get some more clarification on this as it gets closer, is right. the losses that they have against these quality opponents is, one thing I'll probably keep an eye on too. And then you're also going to have these like, kind of games where they're going to play each other. Like we have a, a Georgia tennis, Tennessee matchup coming up on Saturday night. Well, here's the thing though. Here's the thing. Those are five teams that will an 11, one Texas and four, 10 and two SEC teams most likely will be the case. Now it, it could be true that Texas loses to Texas A&M and that's a whole mind fuck. Cause we don't know oh, what's going to happen then. I don't Cause then you have five, 10 and two SEC teams They've all kind of played – I mean, head-to-head would not even really be able to be used as a tiebreaker. I don't know how they're going to figure that out. And if you – of all five of those teams that I've mentioned, one of them will be left out. And it's not going to be Texas. So of the four 10-2 SEC teams – I mean, I'm just assuming Texas wins it all. Of the the four 10-2 SEC teams – it's very hard to make a good argument for any of them being left out because Ole Miss beat Georgia. Right. So if you if you get let Georgia in, you have to let in Ole Miss. Alabama also beat Georgia. So if you let Georgia in, you also have to let in Alabama. Uh, you, and Georgia beat Texas. So if Texas wins the whole thing, it's still kind of hard to leave out Georgia. And if Georgia and Tennessee beat Alabama – so it's if you let in Alabama, it's going to be very tough to leave out. And if Georgia leave, put and it, if Georgia beats Tennessee, well, how can you put in Tennessee without putting in Georgia? There's no good argument. It's like it's like one of those like Venn diagrams or those yeah. little things you'd see that like if this happens, then do this, this, and this, and this. Now, just a little you know program here. We're doing this recording before the, the second CFP rankings coming out. Correct. Like right but, as we finish recording, the rankings will come out. And I can't wait because I, I think what has to happen is I think Georgia needs to plummet and I think they need to fall below Alabama and Ole Miss because those two schools beat Georgia. So the, it, yeah. like the argument that we made last year with Texas and Alabama, how Alabama, if they were going to leap, they cannot, if Alabama was going to take a step up, they couldn't go above Texas because Texas beat them head to head. I think that's that's going to be a major factor the committee is going to look at in the in these rankings. So that's why I think Georgia's got to plummet. I think the AP poll, I think, had it pretty much right and spot on when you look at when you look at the AP poll. I think that's it's going to be similar to what you're going to see with these second rankings. Well, a lot of it's going to depend on what happens next week between Georgia and Tennessee. Like, let's say for the sake of argument, and this is a very likely scenario, Georgia really beats Tennessee badly. Yeah. I mean, I mean by the way, they're I don't think it would be a high game. scoring game, but I think they could beat them badly. And because it feels like a get right game for Georgia a little bit. And like I said, I, I think Tennessee is overrated. I don't think they're that good of a team. Their offense has not clicked with uh Ian Malayaba. So I think that's a very strong possibility. If they really beat Tennessee by a big margin, it's gonna be very difficult to justify leaving out Georgia and putting in Tennessee. It would be impossible to do. And mm. In that scenario, which I think is very, very likely, Georgia has a dominant win against te- uh, against Tennessee and a dominant win at Texas. 
right. it would be kind of difficult to leave them out under those conditions. Um, yeah, in my view, team? in my view, the most justifiable team to leave out in that circumstance, I think, is Tennessee. It's not a good answer, but it's the best one. Yeah, I because think. because you can't. Why would you take? Old Miss or Alabama out, but then put Georgia in when those two schools beat Georgia. Well, well, they can. Well, Tennessee can say, "Well, we beat Alabama." Right. That's, that's, well, but they only have one. Oh, man, it's, you know, we need more. We need more time and more before we can really like put all of this together. Yeah. But I'm gonna but, be fascinated to see when those. But if Georgia come has out. a dominant win against Texas and Tennessee, when they're ten and two, when a whole when a bunch of the other teams are also ten and two. It's kind of it's going to be hard to leave them out. It, you can't really leave them out, especially if they beat Tennessee. You couldn't justify that logically, no. and that would be even worse. Now the thing is, Tennessee beat Alabama in like a comeback win. They didn't dominate Alabama. It's not like they you proved me, they were a much better team. Nick D, you're going to have to really nitpick the the games themselves as yeah. not only just the wins because remember in college football, it's not the NFL where it's you know if you're in the NFL, you win, you move on. That's you win, you get yeah. win in advance. In college, you it's very specific to how you win. Yeah, that's that's the thing. So yeah. that's but, you because have, how you, you have win to, says a lot. What's that? Because how you win says a lot about your absolutely team. yes. I mean, that's yeah, so that's where you're gonna have to nitpick all this, and then who knows what's gonna happen with all these other schools too. So well, well given the fact that like. Okay, so like they can't let in five SEC teams. It just can't happen because you have three Big Ten teams. You have Ohio State, Indiana, and Penn State. Most likely, all eleven and one will all probably make it. Yeah. Then you have whoever wins the ACC, which could be SMU, Miami, Clem. I don't know how it works, but Clemson only has one loss in the ACC right now. Yeah, but they was- need they need help now. Miami losing though was help, but they need some help to get into the ACC championship still. Yeah, so whoever wins situation. the ACC gets in. So that's nine teams right there. You have the at large, but you have the the it, you have the yeah that's eight teams. Notre Dame most likely that's nine. You have the ACC that's ten. The Big Twelve winner that's uh uh wait yeah nine ten. 11 right, the, the, yeah. the big, big the big conferences have one and then the at larges and then you like you said the Notre Dame as well yeah well so the, the point is there's there's not going to be enough because you have <laughs> like if you have five SEC teams and four big I'm sorry not three four big 10 teams that's nine Notre yeah. Dame that's 10 the ACC winner 11 the big 12 winner 12 that's 12 and then the at large but the 13 that's one spot that's left off and well, it's going to be the one of the ten and two SEC teams. That's it. Yeah, that's what it has to be. And by the way, some of these ACC teams might even have a better case, arguably, than maybe that ten and two SEC team. Possibly, I don't know. It's it's possible. I'll tell you though, the, the real interesting thing with last week also was Miami losing to uh, Georgia Tech. Which you know, if we would have predicted that game, I would have said that Georgia Tech would have at least covered it. You know, Miami won too many times this year, falling behind and having to make a, a ferocious comeback. And, you know, I, the biggest thing that always scared me about Miami was Mario Cristobal's, uh, you know, coaching and stuff like that. Yeah. But Georgia Tech's, Georgia Tech's very quietly a pretty decent team. So they jumped out to a big lead, and Miami had to play comeback football. And, you know, you can only do that so many times in a season and be successful. Yeah. Well, they've already done it twice and were able to win. One in three. Uh, they came back three times. To- they, yeah, three they times. Three right? double digit yeah. comeback wins in the second half. Including yeah. that massive twenty-five point one against Cal, and I just felt like well, you know, the most notable that. to me were Virginia Tech and Cal. Yeah, Wait, what was the mm-hmm. other one I'm forgetting? Um, Duke. I think it was Duke. Yeah, I have to okay. look, but you yeah, know, but Georgia Tech though was was blitzing them like crazy. They couldn't pick up the blitz at all in that game Saturday. Uh, but yeah, I mean. Kim Miami reminds, and I said this on last week's show. Miami reminds me a lot of uh, Al, Miami and Alabama seem very similar to me in, in mm-hmm. a sense. Uh, they're both they both have star quarterbacks that they're overly reliant on. They both give up a lot of points. They're both very undisciplined. Um, the, the only difference is that Alabama has a tougher schedule. That's the much main tougher, difference. Much tougher, yeah. A much tougher schedule, which is why they they weren't able to get away with what Miami was able to get away with. And Miami's schedule is not tough enough that. An eleven and one it, it, that they can make the playoffs with an eleven and one record without winning the conference. Mm-hmm. Their schedule isn't strong enough. Um, so I want to get to the story a little bit. You see, Wander Franco got arrested. 
Yes, or again, his name comes up, and a guy that we've talked about a lot on the network this year, and you know he's already been in trouble before, and yeah. now he's in trouble while being in trouble. If that makes any sense. Yeah, uh, was he like on uh, what it was out on parole or something? Yeah, or I so think. apparently it was because he got into a fight in which a gun was drawn. Yeah, so he's currently he's facing weapon weapons charges after an altercation. He's facing charges of illegal use and possession of a firearm related to his arrest in an armed altercation in the Dominican Republic countryside. And he was he was arrested after what police said was an altercation Sunday in the parking lot of an apartment complex in which guns were drawn. Now, so he's he's not allowed to leave the Dominican Republic right now. So he's already. So remember this. He's already well, he on, travel within the country. Yeah. Now, he what's this? He can travel within the Dominican Republic. But I believe so, America. yeah. Now, remember, Franco's already on administrative leave indefinitely from Major League Baseball, and he's due to stand trial in the Dominican Republic on next month, December the 12th, in a separate case of involving charges of sexual abuse, sexual exploitation against a minor, and human trafficking, which could result in a sentence of up to 20 years. Unbelievable. And this other one now, so he's got that and... Uh, yeah, so now he's got two two cases, and remember, he's a he's a kid that just signed like a twelve year extension two years ago. With the Rays. That could be a worse contract than the Deshaun Watson. Contract. Eleven years. Well, so just seventy games into his major league career, he got an eleven year, one hundred eighty two million dollar extension, and this was back in twenty twenty one that he got the extension. Um. Yeah. I, well, you almost can make the case it's worse because who knows if he's ever going to play again. Well, is, but is the money is the money guaranteed? Baseball is fully guaranteed. Now, I don't. Know oh, yeah, that's right. The money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. baseball, everything is. Gonna now, be, remember yeah. the 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 Watson contract was a the, lot of that was guaranteed too, though. Well, it's fully guaranteed. Fully, Watson, fully guaranteed, actually. Yeah, yeah because the guaranteed. owners and the GM of, the, of that great organization decided they were so desperate they gave it to him. But I, I don't know though if they if baseball can get out of that because of a, of a um, of a legal thing like this. I'm not I'm not sure. Because it's it's very rare that these situations happen in Major League Baseball. It's got, but there's got to be something in the terms and conditions. I, I would imagine there is. I mean, and now, just remember, this is now a second instance in a short amount of time with him, and he's such a young guy too. I mean, he's he's just he's a mess. Yeah, he's basically throwing it all away. I mean, if I'm a professional athlete, I would have the I would have the attitude of I'm too rich to get into a fight. You yeah. know what I mean? You you would you would think so. You would think that. You would think that. But professional athletes haven't always had that attitude. It was like Aaron Hernandez continuing to be a criminal when he's a professional athlete. Like he yeah. you, like you don't have to be a criminal anymore. Like you you don't have to be around any of this anymore. And you don't remove yourself from it. And it's, well, in Wander Franco's case too, he's still a young guy. I mean, he's really not grown up. I mean, what is he like twenty? I think three. He's 20, 23, 23, right? I mean, twenty three year olds he's are twenty three, yeah. I mean, geez, three I mean, year olds are yeah. Uh, yeah. So like, like 23 year olds are not very grown up. Uh, it, it's why well, they should be. I mean, you're, you're usually out of school well, by this, then, but this particular one, this, no, this guy, one's not. You should, usually be, you should usually be done with school and, you know, working well, well, done with school and also maybe done with crime. That too, uh, I think would be a pretty good way to go. I mean, <laughs> I'm not going to say you're perfect. I mean, maybe you do bad, you have, you use bad judgment for something, but not, not anything criminal. Like yeah. That. It, it's it's just the whole thing. You, I mean, you I mean, you would think if there was any possibility of him coming back to the major leagues now, and returning. There's no way now. Two instances like this: the first one where he's standing, he's getting, he's going to be in trial next month, could possibly be facing 50 years in jail. Yeah, yeah. So he's the whole thing is just a total mess. Um, I want to get into another edition of unnecessary wagers, which means okay. it's almost the end of the show. Yeah, um, I can't. I'll bet judge. On, I'll judge you. So unfortunately, I can't bet on whether or not Wander Franco is going to face jail time. But I would, I would make that bet if yeah, I got good enough. Like minus three hundred, though. It's <laughs> probably not a good. I also, race. I also can't bet on if your landline is going to ring during this segment. Um, uh, that's that's <laughs> minus one ten. That's just a regular one. No, I think it'll. It, I think it would be more like plus three hundred. Uh, yeah, this time of night. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right, here it is. Here's my unnecessary wager. All right, let's hear this. Um, it's a nine-pick parlay. Okay. Rams minus five at the Patriots. 
Okay. Raiders, uh, Miami, Miami's total uh, over 26 and a half against the Raiders. Okay, I like that. That's a fairly good one. Saints yeah. minus one against the Browns. I like that one. I like that too, yes. Um, I, it's a, it, it's unbelievable that the Saints are a home team. They're only favored by one. Um, yeah, it's a weird game too. Oh, yeah, it is a it's, weird it, game. It's, yeah, what is it? It's the Jameis Winston revenge game. <laughs> yeah. Um, Falcons, or, Falcons plus two and a half against Denver. Sort of surprised they're not favored that game, the Falcons. Oh, you have it at two and a half. Okay. Plus two and a half. You know, man. The Falcons are getting two and a half. They're getting two and a half in Denver. Yeah, I think we might be riding Denver high a little bit and then maybe a little bit of an overreaction to the loss last week, which, by the way, you called that one at least with the Saints getting the points last week. And they and not only did they cover, they won outright. So that was yeah. a winner for you. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting line. I got to think about that when we do uh, the forecast later this week. Yeah. Um, so the – Packers team total over 22 and a half at the Bears. The yeah. Bears, we didn't talk about the Bears. The Bears are a mess right oh, now. I mean, it's coming to the point that at some point that Caleb Williams might be getting benched. Yeah. I, I mean, which, by the way, let me just say, like, I think that sports media really set up Caleb Williams for failure because, like, they kept talking up how good he was going to be and how he was going to lead the Bears to the playoffs. Oh. It, it, it's twofold. First of all, I don't think he was the best quarterback in the draft, and I don't think he's in a great coaching system. So it was, no. a, it, was it was a double whammy there. Yeah. Um, so also Colts plus four at the Jets. Okay. Uh, Lions minus thirteen against Jacksonville. Oh yeah, that game is going to be. I mean, they're going to hit the over by themselves. Yeah, I, I think. So, I, I think that game has like forty-seven to twenty written on it. And then two picks in the commanders. Uh, commanders over 23 and a half total team points. Okay. And the commanders plus three and a half, the spread. Oh, see, that's the key. If they're going to get that extra half a point, um, yeah. that would that would definitely help. And some of those, some of the books this week are getting, we have all uh, games that are getting an extra half a point. It's, gonna, that's going to come in handy. It's $5 mm-hmm. to cash out, which means uh, $1,000 for uh, 1047 and 89 cents. So really five dollars to win 1042 89 cents. Okay. I mean, <laughs> hey, you never know. I mean, I will say this. There's a couple of them that I, I kind of differ on, but um, which ones? I I actually and I'll make this officially this weekend, but I actually feel like the Patriots are gonna keep the game close against the Rams. If you think about it, it's a short week for the Rams. Then they have to come cross country. The Patriots have been playing better, and I like the Rams a lot. But that game on Monday concerned me. If I'm yeah, honest. it's it concerned me especially a little bit. when you look at you know the Cardinals yeah. who are not going away quietly, and the 49ers who are going to be ready to take off soon. I mean, that, yeah. that was a that was a big swing game, and I, I think they will win. But I, I have a feeling it might be a little bit closer. But most of the other ones, I think you would look pretty good. But right. I have to see what the line is going to be when we record later this week. All right. Well, perfect. So thank you for listening, everybody. That's our show this week. Uh, I'm Nick DiMartino. That's Johnny Montalbano. Uh, I'll be back next week. Thanks for listening uh, and watching, everybody.